Hello and good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Competitive Advantage Talks presented by Wasserman at the Sloan Sports Analyst Conference 2018. My name is Adam Riegel, and I am a first year MBA student at the MIT Sloan School of Management. Uh, the current talk now is called Levering, uh, Leveraging Machine Learning and Pitch FX Data to Illuminate the Impact of Pitch Framing, presented by Data Robot. Uh, now presenting uh, is Andrew Engel from Data Robot. Thank you very much. So we've been talking about machine learning as a society for a very long time. There's a very famous quote out there, data is the new oil. Lots of people have talked about that. I never actually liked that quote. So I actually found the raw quote that it started from. And this is what's really important. It's valuable, but if unrefined, it cannot really be used. That's the key that's taking place in all of our industries. That's happening in sports. We live in an era where more and more data is being accumulated, being stored, but we need to turn that data into something that has value. So right, we've got more data, we have new forms of data. We need to be able to use it, and the way we're going to use it is because machine learning is maturing, and we're beginning to be able to automate that process of learning from data. So that's what we're looking at today. That's going to allow us to ask questions that were not possible before. It allows us to dig into the data within sports, but also within business in ways we've never been able to. So if we think about sports, and particularly baseball, that's what I'm going to focus on today, we have our existing metrics. They tend to have been based on easily measurable quantities. Did a player get a hit? Was the pitch a strike? What was the outcome? Who won the game? The problem with this is that it ignores confounding factors. In baseball, the same pitch is going to result in a different result if I have a different player at the plate. If I have exactly the same ball hit, what's going to happen depends on who's in the outfield. If I'm looking at the NBA, there's a big difference between playing with the starters versus playing with the second team. So how can I handle that confounding factor? There's a lot of underlying randomness in sports. How do I handle that randomness? How do I learn what really matters? The other problem from my perspective as a fan is that a lot of these things are proprietary. So I may have the results, I may know what someone's saying, but I don't know what they're doing. I don't know how to evaluate it. But with automated machine learning, I can begin looking at new metrics. I can base it on this new data. I can control for both these confounding factors and this randomness. And I can move into areas that have lacked traditional data. I can begin asking questions about what's the impact of defense? How do I measure the defensive effectiveness? How can I get beyond just the gold glove discussion? And with machine learning, the tools that are out there, the open source tools and now these automated machine learning tools, I can begin to build my own metrics. But further, I can go beyond just building metrics to understand what happened last year, but actually begin to project what's going to happen next year. The goal in sports isn't to win last year, it's to win next year. So how can I put together a team based on the information I have? I've been a data scientist for over a decade. The reason I'm a data scientist isn't because I love the data, but because I want to make better predictions. I want to make better decisions. There are challenges for us. As fans, there's the challenge of access to the data. It's too bad a lot of that data is still held within the teams or within the leagues, but some of that data is available. The pitch FX data is available. That's why I'm working with it today. We also have the problem of too much data. If I look at baseball historically, at-bats is a manageable quantity of data. But if I begin looking at the fielder's movements in real time as a ball's in flight, that can become a massive amount of data. If I begin thinking about in the NBA, or heaven forbid, the NFL, the movement of every single player in every single play, in every single game becomes a massive amount of data. So I need to process this massive amount of data. And if you remember that first quote, if I don't process that massive amount of data, I don't actually have any value from it. 
So I need the ability to apply modern machine learning tools to this data. But we still have the same problem, that data science is one of the hottest fields in all industry today. And it's rapidly changing. There's constantly new techniques coming out. There's new ideas. It's even hard for existing data scientists to stay up to date. So what are we proposing? Automated machine learning can solve a lot of this for you by doing two things. So it can take your existing data scientist, your existing R&D department, and make them more effective. Instead of doing one project a month, maybe they can do five projects a month. But it can turn fans and it can turn other people within the organization into data scientists. It can allow everyone in this room to begin asking questions about what's happening in baseball or what's happening in basketball and answer those very same questions. This was somewhat of a provocative statement that all of you can do this. So let's actually go through and talk about doing this. Let's do this in pitch framing question, right? So this is the idea that the catcher has the ability to influence borderline calls um, on the strike zone. So I've taken the 2016 pitch FX data. I'm focused on only, ball, only pitches that were called balls and strikes. And I want to build machine learning models to predict if a pitch will be a strike or not. I'm going to use auto, automated machine learning techniques. And I'm not going to build one model, but I'm going to build multiple models. And I'm going to be able to talk about the differences between those models, the strengths and weaknesses of those models. And I'm going to be able to explore different approaches. OK. But it isn't enough to simply have built that model. I actually want to make predictions going forward with that model. So I grabbed the same data from 2017. We'll ignore the fact that there were some changes in the way that data was recorded, and there may be some changes in the actual values. I'm going to use my models to predict whether or not a pitch should have been called a strike. I'm going to compare it to the actual numbers of strikes caught. And I'm going to rank catchers based on the difference between these two values. So Stat Corner does this. You can go to the Stat Corner um, website and actually see their approach from this. You can also read about it if you want to know more details about exactly how this is being done. Some caveats. This is not new, right? This has been done for a long time. There's a lot of different approaches. I'm simply classifying whether or not a, a pitch is called a strike. I could actually use the raw probability of it being a strike to calculate the expected number of strikes. That's a different approach. Other people are using this. Oftentimes, this is a proprietary method. So if you actually go to the websites, they don't tell you what their models are. But this isn't limited to this question. You could imagine with PitchFX, I can ask other questions about called strikes or what kind of pitches are likely to be hit, or what's likely to happen if that pitch is hit. So there's a lot of potential within the pitch FX data. But I could look at hit FX data. I could look at field FX data. I could look at NBA gen, next gen stats. Right? So you can take this approach and move it into almost any sport. The other thing I wanted to mention, after I, per, after I put together this presentation and sent it on, there was an interesting article in the Washington Post last week where they're talking to Billy Bean. And he was basically saying the Moneyball era is over. I don't know if you've, any of you saw that article. It's actually a really interesting thing that what he did is he was able to find those players that were undervalued. That's what machine learning can help you do. Everyone's trying to do this. A lot of the baseball teams are now valuing exactly the same thing. What that means is now to gain that competitive advantage, I have to be faster than my opponents. I have to be able to find that weakness, that small undervalue before my opponents do. And I know the moment I find it and begin using it in the free agent market, in the trade market, everyone else is going to figure out what I'm doing. And I'm going to lose that advantage, which means I have to rapidly move on to the next thing. This isn't just in baseball. This is true across all industries. This is happening more and more. Again, we can use these machine learning techniques to allow us to find these more quickly. So let's start with that data. We know the various information about where the pitch was released. 
where it crossed the plate, how much it moved, how fast it was going. We can build the models. There's a lot of open source tools out there. They work really, really well. You have to understand how to use them. Um, takes a fair amount of time, takes a lot of work as a data scientist to actually build. Or I can use an automated machine learning technique and in about 20 minutes generate a bunch of models. So just a handful of models I'm able to generate very quickly and measure their accuracy. I'm going to start simply. I always start simply as a data scientist. I'm going to use a linear type model, so a logistic regression in this case. Um, for those of you who are data scientists or familiar with ROC curves, that's what's on the left hand side. That's a pretty good ROC curve. That's a good model. Um, the second, the right hand side is a plot of the distribution of predictions. So I'm predicting for a given pitch how likely it is to be a strike. So that's the horizontal axis. The green pitches are were called strikes. The purple pitches were called balls. So I see I'm doing a pretty good job of separating between the actual strikes and the actual balls. And if I follow that approach and I look at the pitchers or the catchers I have, I see a list of those catchers who caught a lot of extra strikes over what I think they should have caught and those catchers who did not perform as well. And if you look at this list, Austin Hedges, Tyler Flowers, Yasmani Grandal, these are the, pitcher, or the catchers you expect to see, right? These appear at the top of a lot of these approaches. It's nothing surprising. Um, I'm from San Diego. Yasmani Grandal bothers me because he was traded to the Dodgers, one of my rivals for Matt Kemp. I'm still thrilled about that trade. <laughs> that being said, Hedges is a phenomenal catcher, don't get me wrong. Um, but then you can also look at some of the other catchers who have value on the baseball team, but may not be as strong defensively. There's an issue with this approach. That is, there's confounding factors. There's differences between 2016 and 2017. And I built a linear model. Why is a linear model a problem? Well, I know if I simply look at the strike zone itself, where the ball crosses the plate horizontally or vertically, the relationship between that and whether or not it's a strike is not linear. So the yellow line is what my model thinks the relationship looks like. The orange line is what the relationship actually is. This isn't a good model, just from that perspective. Well, what happens if I'm able to better fit that, better calculate that relationship? So this is a new model that I can use instead. Turns out I can use a technique called extreme gradient boosted tree. It's even a better model. If you look at the right hand plot, it does an even better job of I'm almost always projecting a strike when it is a strike, almost always predicting it's a ball when it is a ball. Much more powerful model. And I can look at those same catchers. And I actually do see some changes. Flowers and hedges actually changed um, the relationship. Flowers is now the better catcher under this model. James McCann was first or second in the last one. He's dropped to the fourth, fourth worst as opposed to the worst catcher. So we see that we're beginning to see different behaviors. But I've completely ignored the impact of the pitcher, the hitter, the umpire, the type of pitch, and a number of other things. There's a big difference between catching with the LA Dodgers staff and some less accomplished staffs. So how does that take, how do we take that into account? If I'm catching a knuckleball pitcher, that's going to change how I look compared to someone who's only catching fastballs. So baseball prospectus actually follows this approach where we need to control for this. So let's build different models for pitch type or for handedness of pitcher and handedness of batters. I don't need to do that. Modern machine learning techniques are powerful enough that I can simply incorporate them within the model. So I have a new model where I get, even, this is only a slightly better model from this perspective, very similar probability of strike or probability of ball, but I begin seeing very different behaviors where Austin Hedges and Tyler Flowers have swapped. 
okay? But we're beginning to see Martin Maldonado has now moved in front of Yasmani Grandal in terms of their ability. Most interesting is James McCann went from really bad to much less bad, but you can begin to see how using that information can allow you to really dig in and understand the catcher's impact on the strike call. So this is the approach of building predictive models, using them to make predictions, and then allowing you to use those predictions to evaluate performance, or potentially say with that last model, well, okay, I'm looking at this catcher. I know what my staff looks like. What happens if I put this catcher now in that staff? How is that going to work? But what if I actually wanted to pull out the impact of the catcher on the call? Think back to that plot where I showed you the horizontal and vertical distribution of pitches in the strike zone. What if I could do the same thing over the catchers? What if I could actually pull out from the model's perspective how a catcher impacts the strike call? It turns out I can do that. So this plot's a little bit small, but I can actually see from the yellow dot my model's perspective of how the catcher himself influences the strike. So the higher the yellow dot, the better that catcher is, the more likely my model thinks that catcher is going to catch a strike. So we now see my model actually likes Yasmani Grandal. We're back to the Matt Kemp trade, sorry. Um, Yasmani Grandal is the best catcher from this model's perspective. Buster Posey shows up um, second, but we actually see Austin Flowers has fallen off from this model's perspective. So we're finding something different. So it allows us to begin digging in in a different way. So where do we go from here? We can build models to predict what should have happened. We can use the, the results of these models to better evaluate talent. There's a huge problem, not just in um, baseball, but in all sports, that we're spending a great deal of money. We need to make sure that money pays off. So how do we uh, evaluate actual talent? We've seen some weird stuff happening in the free agency market recently. How are we evaluating free agents? How are we evaluating how likely they're going to perform over the course of their contract? And we can open up to evaluation to areas that lack good underlying data before. So we can talk about pitching talent and batting talent and fielding talent from the new data that's being recorded. In basketball, we can begin talking about the actual impact on the result. But we can also begin asking questions about how do I measure defensive talent in the NBA? or true offensive ability independent of their ability to make a shot? How does one player's ability to stand on the court and make the ball move impact the entire um, scoring performance of a basketball team? Or in soccer, or in football. These tools open up the ability to ask those questions and hopefully make better business decisions. So I wanna close with a comment about where we stand in society, so this is a con uh, comic for those people who can't read it in the back, right? The coffee maker has just beaten this poor scientist. I remember when only a deep learning supercomputer could beat me in a data science competition. This is where we're coming. Everything that can be automated will be automated. This is happening in machine learning, but we can take advantage of this and use this to drive better decisions. So now, thank you. So are there questions? Yes, please. Uh, did your model that accounts for catcher level specificity? Yeah. I'm starting over in this particular case, yeah. You could do that, but in this particular case, because those techniques allow me just to add those factors and build additionally, I can do exactly that. Yeah. Um, and as with like Jonathan Lucroy, you have as one of the worst defensive yeah. catchers, but three years, and I, I got the same thing you got, but three years ago, he was like the best defensive catch framing number. So how do you, it's hard for me to imagine he got significantly worse over three years, even though that's what the data suggests. How do you rectify that? 
Yeah, I, I mean, it's an interesting question. I think part of it, right, if you remember the 2017 season, there was some controversy as they changed the technique they were using to provide some of the pitch tracking data. And there may be some of the questions about, is it set up the same way? Is it actually giving us the same information? So I think that might be something. It's a question we could explore in the data. We can try to answer that. It is an interesting question. You also see over the last few years, if you read the people who've been doing this, there's kind of a narrowing as well, right? We're not seeing the wild swings in quality. Yeah, I, but I agree with you. It is, it's weird to me that someone who's been so good for so long would all of a sudden just have a horrible year. This doesn't seem like the kind of skill where that would degrade. Yeah, so I think it's probably a data problem. We have a question. Yeah, so the question was how do you avoid overfitting? So overfitting, if I can actually go back to the slide. We'll get there. Okay, so overfitting is I have a very nice shape, right, that I'm trying to fit. I was originally fitting a linear model, which is just a horrible fit of that curved line. Overfitting is I'd fit the last line and I actually go through every single point. And I don't believe that's the case because I believe my data is somewhat random. So how do I get to that middle point? There's a number of techniques. Most of these machine learning techniques, there are ways to help them avoid overfitting. But one of the best ways is never, ever evaluate your data on the data you use to train your model. Always look at your model's performance on new data. So when I said I was building in 2016, I actually took about 40% of 2016's pitches and set them aside and used that to evaluate the effectiveness of my model before I went and made the prediction on 2017. Other questions? Yeah. So, so this is a really good question, and this happens in data science. His question is, what do you do when the computer gives you a result that doesn't seem to make sense, that is counterintuitive? And so there's a couple of things you can do. I didn't spend a lot of time talking about it, but there are ways to extract information from the model about how the model's making the decision. When you see those sorts of results, you need to stop and think about it. It's very easy in data science to lie to yourself. So how do we avoid doing that? And that is be skeptical. When it begins making those decisions, look into it. Does it make sense? When I see a catcher who for the last three years was performing really well and he falls off, that's a sign we should go look at something. Something's going on. Maybe he had a bad year. That's possible. But maybe it's something else and I need to think about what's happening. So it's look at that. Dig into the data, dig into the predictions, take a look at it. But at the same time, be very careful when it exactly meets what you expect, because you should still be doing that same level of analysis. Yeah. So, so let, let me make sure I got the question. It was a little soft. Was does the automated machine learning need to? Do you need to spend the time thinking about the question and formulating the right question as opposed to maybe doing the same thing as in the past? Yeah, I mean, I guess my question was, do you think the automated machine learning encourages you to sort of push a button and take the best model and sort of create it like So that's a really good question. So the question was, does automated machine learning encourage you to just? Um, push a button and not think creatively. I'd actually argue it makes it easier for you to think creatively. So when you look at it, because I can push the button and build these models, it allows me to try lots of different things. So it gives me the opportunity to ask lots of different questions and frame the problem lots of different ways. So I think it actually helps you do that exploration. Does that answer the question? So I've been told I'm out of time, so thank you very much.